Hello and welcome. You're watching Head to Head. I'm Carrie Oderman with UATV. Last month, Ukraine's government adopted action plan on integrated border management strategy for the period until 2025. The adoption of the strategy is another step towards making the Ukrainian border more transparent. How effective is this plan and what kind of results can Ukraine expect once integrated border management strategy is fully implemented? To discuss this, we welcome to our studio today Ruslan Minich, a policy analyst with Europe Without Borders Think Tank. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Have you ever crossed the border between Poland and Ukraine in a car? Uh, yes, I did. But that was a part of our research that we did uh, to cross a few border posts. Okay, this is very credible the way you took this. You, you went and personally crossed. What was your experience there and how has your research done anything to improve that if it needed improving? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> well, that was only a part of the research. Uh, our idea was to talk to people that live there, to talk to officials that are there, that are working at the border, and of course to experience ourselves, uh, how, how, how is it to cross the border by car. And that was a time of, of holidays, that's why the border was really crowded. And uh, as you know, a few days uh, ago, there was uh, the same problem right now at the uh, border between Poland and, and Ukraine. Uh, also because of the holiday period, people are coming back and, and, and there are goods going to the Poland right now. So that was the same problem. Uh, so um, we can say that uh, uh, the burden to the border uh, is fluctuating on holidays, on hot seasons. It's overcrowded. Uh, you can wait. Uh, I heard even stories about a few days uh, at the border, which is, you know, terrible. Uh, but uh, it's not all the time like that. Of course, there are days when it's more or less okay. But it also depends on the border posts, on the infrastructure, if it's developed or not, um, on the direction of people, where are they going, because the, the, the choice of border posts depends on this. If these are people coming from uh, borderlands, living right there, or people coming from more distant regions. So there are many factors that affects, uh, that, that influences uh, the border between Ukraine and Poland, but this is definitely the most crowded border uh, or, or if we consider all, all, all parts with, with other countries of EU, non-EU countries. And this is the most crowded border for Poland as well. Uh, that's why we thought that it deserves attention. Um, from different points of view, political, social, economic, uh, from the point of view of people living there, and, and so on and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about the sociological aspect of this. Okay. A lot of the borders in post-World War II Europe are not natural geographic borders. Sometimes they're just lines drawn. Sometimes they're along rivers, but usually, usually they're just lines drawn. People have been living on both sides of these borders that have been drawn, drawn rather ar arbitrarily. How is your work maybe going to improve the relationship? Because as you mentioned, people are going <coughs> back and forth between Poland and Ukraine all the time. How is this going to affect the relations of people on both sides? Right. Uh, we've seen that um, Poland is very popular for people, uh, for Ukrainians, especially for Ukrainians. Poles are also crossing, but uh, to less extent. Uh, the reasons why they cross uh, um, can be different, but the, the most uh, frequently we met is, of course, labor migration, so they go for seasonal work there, uh, and also small-scale trade, like uh, people go, people take some stuff uh, from Ukraine that is cheaper there, go there, sell in Poland, then they buy some food, it's usually vegetables or something like that, for the oven use, personal use, or to sell here in Ukraine. So this, this is kind of a way to, to make some living for them. Um, and this is one of, of few opportunities that they actually have to earn some money. Uh, traveling there, we actually seen that um, this way of living, because this is a lifestyle right now for them, uh, is usually perceived um, as negative by, by people living from more distant regions and often by officials. And uh, we have some attempts by Ukraine to, to restrict, to limit somehow the small border trade. Um, because this is also a, a, 
um, a factor that influence the queues uh, and, and make the border overcrowded. Uh, so this is a way to resolve it. But we were thinking, and while we were, we were traveling there, uh, we were thinking that uh, uh, before dealing with this problem, we, we cannot just ban it or, or restrict because uh, this is not the, the, the root cause of, of this phenomenon, right? Uh, so we were thinking that, first of all, we, we should propose some alternatives how to make the, the living for people in other ways. And we, we talking to locals, um, you know, they are so, so full of ideas. Uh, and many of these ideas are related to tourism. Uh, they even propose to create a water crossing point. Uh, there is the, the river Bok, mm -hmm. and Poles very like to <clears throat> paddle on kayaks. Uh, and uh, now they, they have to take this kayaks uh, across the border and then go to the river again. And they propose wh why not to, to make the, the water crossing point that, that they don't have to uh, carry this kayaks, uh, you know, to cross the border. Uh, also, it's very full of beautiful nature. And uh, in a far cry from uh, Polish side, it's untouched, basically, it's wild, and this is what attracts Polish citizens. And it's also full of history, or, uh, beautiful, really, architecture, um, uh, which resonates with Poles as well, because we have a shared history, and they often visit these places. Um, they make uh, religious pilgrimages also to Ukraine and from Ukraine. So there is a big potential, but uh, there is a need for investments to, to develop this. Uh, um, local authorities, they have different plans, they have uh, different projects al already developed. The only thing they need is uh, basically financing. And by developing the tourism, you know, we, we think that uh, uh, it can um, give some impetus to economic development, to regional development, because more tourists are there, more people are able to open shops, restaurants, you know, from hotels, motels, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but for this, we need investments, first of all, but also to develop the infrastructure. And uh, infrastructure um, is crucial. Uh, it's crucial. To, to make, to streamline the crossing, the experience of crossing, because to some border posts it's, it's really hard uh, to get to them by car, because there is no good roads. So you improve the crossing and deal with the queue issue, but also uh, in this way you give some impetus to economic development on, for, for towns, villages that are near this, this roads, because in this way you connect somehow this uh, towns to the rest of the country and uh, if you open some filling station there or something like that there's you know. revenues there yes so right. if I understand you correctly by improving the infrastructure making the border crossing easier there is going to be a better exchange however yeah. there's probably security concerns too the border between Ukraine and Poland is one of the Eastern Europe's gateways to the European Union were there any special concerns to think about uh, right <clears throat> Uh, and we are not talking, you know, uh, to, to streamlining the processes, uh, but lowering the security, not at all. Uh, there are many solutions that you can do without compromising the, the security part. Um, and for instance, we are talking right now about um, the criminalization of smuggling. Uh, and locals, for example, they fear that uh, that might um, somehow have an impact on uh, they, the small border trade. Because often in Ukraine it's called as smuggling. But they do not violate any rules, in fact. And it's not a smuggling. That's why this is kind of myth that should be um, dealt. So we should talk to locals that, you know, by criminalizing smuggling, we do not mean that you cannot uh, cross the border with some bag of food or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are not talking about, um, about compromising security. security. Is there a way that your think tank, who made some suggestions, was thinking about maybe making it regionally easier for people that live along the border to cross um, in an expedited manner once security checks have gone through? Is there any program like that here in Ukraine? Uh, specifically for locals, you mean? Yeah, that live right along the border crossings. Uh, well, not in terms of security, but of course um, we have right now only one pedestrian crossing, okay. which is really overcrowded. Uh, there was the second one in Uhreniu, uh, which is uh, far north, basically. 
it's very small border crossing, but it was very important for locals because we see a big drop after it was closed uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, and we think it's a good idea to open the border crossing there uh, and to open more pedestrian crossing. It, it will be really uh, good for locals. And in this way, they will not, uh, mm, you know, uh, contribute to this burden to the cars. They will be able to cross uh, by feet. Uh, basically, uh, the border. The, the other point is, for example, uh, at Rava Ruska, uh, it has also potential for pedestrian crossing, and there is um, the Polish loan that is discussed for years. Uh, it was signed, the contract was Poland on site in 2015. It has many elements, but one of the elements is to create pedestrian crossing at this uh, Rava Ruska uh, border post. And it's still not moving, basically, anywhere. And we think it's important to push uh, this Polish loan and its implementation. It will make life of people easier and this pedestrian crossing as well. A lot of times to understand something, you end up making comparisons to other situations. As Ukraine is moving more towards Western Europe and working with Poland together, um, they're finding solutions. What kind of solutions need to be found in Eastern Ukraine for the border crossings? Have you done any work in that area? Uh, well, um, in, you mean contact line? Uh, no, we didn't research this this border. We focused uh, right now on the EU border, and we are talking about mainly the way to make the border more uh, look like the EU border, uh, because we are we are having EU integration, and we believe that the EU approach, and you mentioned the action plan for the integrated border management, which is the concept developed by the EU. Uh, we think that we are, uh, that the border will be closer to the EU standards, and uh, we are hoping that maybe at the end, having the standards like in the EU, uh, we will abolish at some point, you know, and, and enter the Schengen area uh, in this way. Uh, and we need this uh, integrated border, mo border management, not just, you know, to implement the EU regulation. It has many practical uh, contribution because um, th the basic idea of what is integrated border management is that everybody working, all services, uh, all institutions, they uh, cooperate between each other and they exchange, uh, they have a good exchange of information between each other. And what is important that this exchange of information is, uh, is done in real time. Because, for instance, uh, right now, um, if you consider that there is a track and it, it can cross the border uh, between Ukraine and Poland or Hungary, whatever. So uh, there is the risk of smuggling in a way that uh, the driver can show one, or the exporter, the trader, can show one document for the Ukrainian custom okay. officials and the other document for Polish custom official. And the Ukrainian custom official right now have to write the email and waiting for the response. And, uh, you know, okay. the truck can be already in the EU till it gets the response. So we think that the integrated border management is saying, right, 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 that, that there should be real-time exchange of information between Ukraine and EU officials. And in this way, they can see, well, the documents are different, so we should do something Maybe with this trade. Right? Yes, okay. yes. So this is the way how it improves the, the security. But it also improves the, the experience. It makes the crossing faster. For instance, uh, right now, uh, and the action plan you mentioned, it also envisions the so-called joint control. Because right now, uh, when you cross the border, you are crossed by Ukrainian mm -hmm. uh, borders, then customs, then Polish borders and customs. The joint control means that they all sit together and check only once. Okay. And you cross quickly. But there is a problem right now. We cannot sign the agreement. Uh, right now, uh, there, is, there are talks for years uh, between Ukraine and uh, Hungary and, um, and Slovakia. Uh, they cannot agree one point related to the jurisdictional uh, matters because uh, Ukraine has its constitution and EU has its, uh, its border code and there are some differences and they are looking for the solution how to, you know, how to reconcile them. Are you optimistic that they'll be able to do that in the next few years? Uh, I think that yes, because uh, I see the constructive, uh, the constructive spirit from both sides. 
but this is a legal thing and you know sometimes it's it's really hard to to find the solution but uh, i really hope and uh, we are always talking of, uh, when we talk to eu and ukrainians that we, we always emphasize that we need this because it makes uh, uh, the, the crossing more secure but also faster and more comfortable for people so it's everything in one bottle everything good in one bottle so a great way to end the interview with hope optimism and talking about a bottle when we're talking about things that should and <laughs> should not year, cross yeah. the... All right. That was Ruslan Minich, policy and analyst, Europe Without Barriers, Think Tank. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more. Yeah.